hello. Say it again. This is California. The picture, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not the band. The band was the Beatles. Have you ever heard of Beatles before? All righty. So welcome back, everybody. I hope that we all got down to the bottom of it. I hope we all know the real answer about whether or not we can trust those damn scientists who are giving us all that fake news on YouTube and on Reddit. S idiot scientists. Lame. Um, you know, one important thing. Uh, I recently came across recently came across a talk by Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm not sure if any of you know him. And, uh, and he, was <laughs> he was giving a talk... He was giving a talk on uh, trusting science and what an insidious virus it is. My words, not his. Um, that, uh, that people have stopped trusting the scientific community. That there's this real urge to go back to tribalism, a real urge to trust groupthink rather than actually trusting scientists. And uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson said that, uh, that you can't deny climate change and use a cell phone. Because the technology that's in your cell phone is the same kind of science that's been used to prove that the climate is warming. You can't have one and not the other. He also looks at the scientific method and he says, you know what, all these people are right. We are humans, we're totally humans. We, it's possible that we make mistakes. We're using extrapolation. We're using data sets to talk about things uh, the best that we possibly can. We're prone to make errors. But this is the best thing that we have ever come up with. Peer review, the idea that there are people motivated to prove you wrong. You publish, and someone is motivated to prove you wrong. They want to tear apart your article. And if they can't do it, then your article gets a little bit more sway. It gets a little bit more power. This is the best thing we've ever come up with. Okay? So, um, so those are some of Neil deGrasse Tyson's thoughts on why we should trust scientists. But you can't trust him. He is a scientist, after all. Uh, so I'd like to talk for a little while about, <laughs> oh, I'd like to talk about so many things, but tonight for some reason we're talking about climate change and we're talking about global environmental devastation. Um, so there are, there's so much to this whole debate, not this whole debate, this whole talk, to this whole subject that I would love to be able to go into so much more detail with with you guys. Um, but unfortunately, we only have, you know, two and a half or three hours here together tonight. Um, so there's, there's just a limit to the amount that we're going to be able to do. Um, so there's a lot more. If you guys know any really cool facts uh, uh, that I don't get to here, feel free to just shout them out or speak into the microphone. Um, but, uh, but, until, um, but until then, I'll, just, I'll give you what I got. We have limited time, so I just got to push it all together. Okay. So, <clears throat> Uh, TheEconomist.com, um, even though it's a .com, it actually still is a reputable source, um, the, the Economist has put together uh, many different articles, many different studies on the meteorological uh, disasters, the hydrological disasters, and the climatological disasters that have been sweeping the world for the last few decades. So when we talk about meteorological disasters, what we're talking about are storms, are hurricanes, um, are typhoons. When we talk about hydrological Hydrological disasters, we're talking about floods and landslides and avalanches, anything to do with water. And when we talk about climatological disasters, we're talking about extreme temperatures, that's extreme cold, or most often, extreme heat. We're also talking about droughts that are caused by this heat, and also by forest fires that are caused by this heat, and probably a lot of you have seen much of the news in the last few months about these raging forest fires, yeah? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, yep. Yeah. Please. This is the number of natural disasters, not the number of articles. Thank you. Yeah, this is the number of natural disasters. Um, so, yeah, we see this increase, and what I would have loved to have done was to plot this on top of uh, the rising CO2 levels uh, and the rising... Um, and the rising temperatures, but I didn't just, I didn't really have time for that. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we see this huge increase. So we can break some of these apart a little bit. So the first one, anybody know this animal? 
black rhino. Yeah, yeah, the West African black rhino. It's not a donkey. Close, though. Close. Um, so what? right now, this is being referred to as the Holocene extinction. So Holocene, again, is this, uh, this time of human beings having such an intense influence on the earth. This is also called the sixth extinction. Um, so species extinction is actually normal. If you look at the history of the world, new species come along and other species die. Other species die out. This is a pretty standard thing that's gone on forever. Um, but what we haven't seen is the incredible increase of the, the incredible acceleration of dying out of so many species around the world. So the standard rate of extinction is somewhere around one to five species per year. This is what we see for a very long time. And this comes from the WWF, the World Wildlife Federation. Right now, we're losing something uh, like 1,000 or 10,000 times the normal rate. Now, this is a huge variance, right? 1,000 and 10,000. So I'm sorry. But um, as it turns out, if you look up different sources, they all give you different numbers. They give you different variances. Um, and this is because understanding how many animals go extinct is a really difficult business. Extinction, us proving extinction, has to do with not seeing an animal for a long time. So just because we haven't seen it for a long time, then we can say that it's extinct. So there's a very good chance there are many animals that are extinct that we just don't consider extinct. Does that make sense? Okay. So right now, we're losing dozens of species every single day. Um, this is caused by a lot of different factors that all tie into climate change, um, namely habitat destruction, exploitation, that's exploitation of the animals themselves and also exploitation of their habitats, um, and also the rising temperatures of the earth. Um, all of the other um, effects of climate change that we were talking about, flooding, um, drought, uh, famine. So right now, Half of the world's wild, non-human animal population um, has been lost in the last 40 years. So this is number. This is a, a total number of animals. This is not number of species. This is total number of animals in the world has been lost in the last 40 years. Now this is wild, non-human animals. The number of domesticated or really agricultural uh, non-human animals has increased sharply in the last couple of decades. But in terms of wild animals, that's gone down almost by half. Anyone know this animal? Yeah, it's the ibex. Yeah, the Pyrenean ibex. So, um, that IPC report that was published back on the 8th of October this year, um, they were looking at the effects of climate change at 1.5 degrees Celsius, even though most scientists for the last few decades have been concentrating on 2 degrees Celsius uh, of increase. So, um, what, um, what they found was that um, if there is a, an increase of only 1.5 degrees Celsius, we'll project it. This is all projected, um, but um, we'll lose 6% of insect species, whereas with 2% increase, we'll lose about 18. This is all about. These numbers aren't perfect. Um, at 1.5, we'll lose about 8% of plant species, whereas with 2%, we'll lose about 16. 4% versus 8% of vertebrae species as well. So there's a pretty substantial difference just when looking at spatial variation in the world, um, whether we hit this 2 degree mark or this 1.5 degree mark. When we hear you know, 0.5 degrees Celsius, it doesn't sound like a substantial shift. But when you see the ramifications, the long-term ramifications of this, it's pretty huge. So... Um, Sea level rise is caused from a, diff, uh, a few different factors. So first, there's the melting of the Antarctic ice sheets and land ice. This is one that we're all probably familiar with, right? So if all of the Antarctic ice sheets melt, then we're looking at something like 80 to 160 foot rise of sea level. So we definitely can't let that happen. We definitely can't let that happen. That's most of the world, well, I don't know if it's most of the world, but it's most of the world's major cities underwater. 
There's a second reason for sea level rise, which I think a lot of people aren't familiar with, actually, and this is called thermal expansion. So maybe some of you, um, if you can imagine making a cup of tea, uh, and the tea is really hot, and then you put the and and when you fill up the the cup of tea, when you fill it up with water, you fill it up to the very brim, and then as you let it cool, the water actually di- dives down underneath of the brim of the cup, and that's because cooler things take up less space. As the water heats up, it expands. As it cools, it gets smaller. So as global temperatures, as average temperatures of waterways around the world increases, then we also see an increase of the volume of those waterways, right? So this is in addition to the melting of the Antarctic ice sheets. So um, there are many different projections for how high sea levels might rise in the next few decades. Um, They're expected to rise something like 0.2 to 2 meters by the year 2100. Um, Point two is with a very conservative estimate. That is, if if we're able to really get our act together and implement a lot of policy change, then we're going to see something like 0.2 meters uh, increase by the year 2100. Um, If, though, we only meet this 1.5 degree increase, 1.5 degree increase, then we'll see a 2 meter increase increase. And with that two meter increase, we'll see Bangladesh, New York, Bangkok, underwater. This also creates a positive feedback loop. So again, as the ice melts, the earth reflects less heat. It reflects less heat back into space. So we retain more heat here on earth. Also, There's a lot of carbon that's stored in the oceans. So as there's more water that evaporates, then we see that um, uh, as there's more water that evaporates, then more carbon is released into the atmosphere, uh, increasing the greenhouse effect. Yeah. Any questions about this one? Yeah, please. I thought so. You said that as so carbon goes from the ocean to the atmosphere. Is that what you just said? I thought the ocean was like the biggest carbon sink. I thought it was the ocean and then the rainforest. Like acidification of the ocean and the carbon dioxide dissolves. So as as far as I understand, yeah, uh, please, actually, as far as I understand, both of those things are true, that um, the the ocean is absorbing a lot of carbon and creating acidification. At the same time, uh, much of the waterways, uh, much of the water is evaporating, then bringing a lot of that carbon out into the atmosphere. Yeah. So you're right, the, the oceans are the biggest sink of uh, carbon on, on the planet after, and then the forests afterwards. But what happens when the seas start to warm, you get um, methane hydrates, so essentially like methane that's trapped as ice in the very, very bottom parts of the ocean. And as that warms, those methane hydrates will be released, and then you get massive upwelling of um, methane, which eventually becomes CO2 as well. That's been one of the positive feedback loops in some of the previous climate changes that have happened like way back in the geological past. And it's a scary possibility that if we get to that point then you get this feedback loop and run away uh, climate change. Um, could you just introduce yourself real quick? Just tell, <laughs> tell, us, your, just tell us your background. Yeah, yeah, just um, like okay, so my name's Danny. Uh, I studied environmental science uh, as an undergraduate and did an MSc in environmental science as well. So I did a module in paleo, paleoclimatology, so that's the study of the climate in the deep past. So the, the um, graph that we were looking at before it goes back about 400,000 years, which seems like a really long time, but actually in terms of geological time, it's nothing. It's like the top layer of like all the way back through history. And in that 400,000 years, we've not really gone above 300 parts per million of CO2. But if you go back way, way further, there have been times when it has been much higher than it is now, much higher than 400 parts per million. To give you an idea of how much energy there is in the system. The last time that CO2 levels were about 400 parts per million or higher, sea levels were 10 meters higher than they are today. So you have to understand that even if we switch everything off today and burn no more carbon, that the the climate will continue warming and you'll continue to get that sea level rise happening. So the, the problem we face is essentially not just how do we reduce carbon, but we need to actively take it out of the atmosphere as well. So it is a pretty monumental challenge. Uh, there's 
There's various geoengineering possibilities. People try, try to seed the oceans to, with uh, iron filings to try and increase phytoplankton and, and reduce the CO2 that way. There's also uh, an idea that you could have like um, sodium carbonate trees, so essentially like artificial trees where you, you um, sequester the carbon and then bury it, but nothing's really been proven technically possible apart from putting sulfates in the atmosphere, which would be reflective and you can, it's not, <laughs> I'm not going to get it. You can, you can reflect sunlight, basically, and that's a kind of a scary possibility because actually any single country could go and ahead and do that without checking with the rest of us. But. Awesome. Um, so, uh, so I am not an environmental scientist. Um, so my, my background is in theater and philosophy. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> so um, m uh, I hope that Daniel is able to stick around and hopefully answer any questions you guys have near the near the end. Um, yeah, Paul. Yeah. Why did you first talk about an 80-foot rise of all the ice melts, but then later you talk about a two meters by 2,100? I'm not sure why those numbers are different. Great. Yeah. So first of all, we're talking about a difference in, in time frame. So this second this second number is limited just to uh, by the year 2100. Second, this is based on projections about current um, about current carbon in the atmosphere and our current carbon production. So um, we're probably not based on current models going to be melting all of the Antarctic ice sheet. Right. Um, if that were to happen, we'll see an increase projected something like 80 to 160 feet. Um, that probably will not happen. Much more likely is something on the order of 0.2 to 2. Now, if we actually see the worst of the climate change models, these numbers are much, much higher. So this is based on the idea that we do do something about this, that we do enact policy that decreases our carbon emissions, um, even to get to two meters of rise. Okay, any other questions about these? Yeah, um, let me head back. Uh, yeah, um, I'd like to just say uh, your comments. Um, thank you very much for those, they were really insightful, so thank you. Um, I think, Uh, I'm really pleased that you've started talking about feedback loops and it just gives um, people an idea of how multi-layered and complex this issue is but we also need in the interest of showing the other side of the argument looking at the negative feedback loops associated with climate change um, for example uh, when you're getting more carbon in the atmosphere you're stimulating the process of photosynthesis and potential for more plants which then will take out carbon from the atmosphere again we don't know how that will work, will it be beneficial to us in total? Um, you talked about um, reflecting sunlight, like, you know, we, we already know about global dimming and actually a lot of the pollution that's going up into the atmosphere works to reflect some of the sunlight as well. And where is the balance there? Do, you know, are we still, um, how far are we away are we from uh, having a situation where what we're doing, which we know is bad, is actually um, reducing the problem rather than contributing to the problem. So I think we just need to always bear in mind that whilst we can hear about positive feedback loops like reduced albedo and, and, and uh, methane being emitted from melting permafrost and stuff like that, we should also remember that it's a really multi-layered issue and we still, we're still trying to get our heads around it. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm really glad that there was some, some variation in the audience. Um, I, I know that when I polled you guys, it was a pretty, you know, left or right or one or zero kind of polling, and I'm sorry about that. I know that a lot of us have pretty varied beliefs on this topic. So, okay. Um, so, what we're also going to see is um, projected to be quite a lot of flooding around the world. Um, so, um, most rainwater and most snow um, comes from two different sources. So one of those is from evaporation from the oceans, uh, and that makes up about 60% of rain um, and about 60% of snow. Now, about the, the remaining 40% is just recycled over continents. Yeah, so it goes into ponds or it goes into the soil or it goes into rivers or streams. Um, that makes up about 40%. Um, 
as the world warms, we see that the evaporation both over the oceans and within the continents is going to increase. And because this increases, um, there's going to be more rain that's able to, um, there's, there's going to be more rain that's able to drop on these areas. So as the atmosphere gets warmer, as the atmosphere gets warmer, it's able to hold more water. So when it rains, the rain is so much more intense. We're going to see a lot of changing of weather patterns around the world, a lot of changing of weather systems. But what we'll also see is that in places where the weather system stays relatively on the same track, that when it does rain, the rain is going to be so much more severe. On the flip side of this, and it seems a little counterintuitive, but at the same time, we see an increase of flooding and an increase of storms, we also see droughts. So in general, what we're going to see is that areas where there's already quite a lot of rain, quite a lot of storms, the rain and the storms, the severity is going to increase greatly. In places where there's already quite a lot of drought, we're going to see that the drought is going to increase greatly. Cool? Any questions about those two? Cool. Okay. Great. Yeah, or you see, well, yeah, I mean, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And of course, um, you can actually have, in the same area, right, you can have uh, both a flood, both storms, and a drought. So a drought isn't really about having, you know, one storm that rolls through. You can be in a drought for years and then have one massive storm roll through. Um, and it'll actually cause a lot of destruction, eroding away all of the top layer. Okay. Because of the changing weather patterns, um, I hope you see that there's a kind of narrative here, kind of flow. Um, because of the changing weather patterns, because of the increased heat, because of the drought, and because of the flooding, we're going to see increased famine all around the world. So according to the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of America, they say for the third year in a row, there has been a rise in world hunger. The absolute number of undernourished people, that is, those facing chronic food deprivation, has increased to nearly 821 million in 2017. And this is from around 804 million in 2016. These are levels from almost a decade ago. So, um, you know, throughout the last several decades, we've been modifying crops. And we could say that maybe we've been selecting crops uh, to have the highest yield for, um, I mean, since the agricultural revolution. We've been selecting these crops. And we've been selecting these crops to have the highest yield in these particular environments. Um, of course, every environment is different. But in these environments, we've been selecting these particular crops. As the climate changes, as the amount of water changes, as the heat changes, um, these crops are not going to be nearly as efficient at creating food. So we're going to see this increased famine. Everybody understands the connection there, yeah? Yeah. Okay. The FAO goes on to say that besides conflict, climate variability and extremes are also a key force behind the recent rise in global hunger. They're also one of the leading causes of severe food crisis. And this is primarily due, again, to land degradation, desertification, water scarcity, and rising sea levels. Yeah, please. Yeah. Can I actually? Maybe you're just maybe you're continuing to talk about it, but um, couldn't we also look at um, animal agriculture as as one of the reasons why uh, we're having all this famine? Yeah. Um, no doubt. No doubt. Um, uh, I'm a vegan. Hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> So we had a talk here, uh, what, 
Yeah, four, four, yeah. We had a talk here four weeks ago uh, on, on veganism where we did fly into those issues quite a lot. Um, and veganism is, without a doubt, one of the best individual choices that a person can make without having to go through any higher institution to combat climate change. Um, whether or not in these places um, meat consumption is the primary cause, at least it doesn't seem to be th according to the FAO. They don't claim that, that meat eating is the primary cause there. Um, yeah, I definitely think that in places, we find that in places where they uh, have um, water shortages, they're also exporting a lot of their uh, meat, a lot of their chickens, um, out of these countries. This is in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they're exporting chickens for uh, an income, even though they don't have enough water uh, to keep themselves hydrated. So I'm sure that, that adds to the issue. Um, yeah, I'll take this back here. Can we just pass back this microphone? Thank Thank you. I mean, famines in particular, I mean, talking that, uh, about that as a, as a climate change issue is missing the point in history, basically, because famines have been caused by bad economics, right? By basically one of the uh, biggest famines that killed people in India. Let's, I mean, it's a Bengal, famous Bengal famine. There wasn't a food. Amartya Sen got this Nobel Prize basically because he, he talked about this that, you know, that there was enough food, but it wasn't being going. It was not given to people who were starving to death because it was seen as uh, an economic thing to do, right? I mean, you, you can't have, you can't give free food to people because, you know, that's bad for the economy, right? So there's a fundamental undergirding of, of, of a lot of this. Um, so I was just telling them, like, if you can't talk about critically about in tackling climate change. We might be missing the point. Yeah, definitely very fair. Definitely very fair. Uh, I also think that if we don't consider climate change to be an economic issue, I think that we're missing a huge point uh, of the conversation around climate change. Yeah, of course. Of course. Okay. Um, uh, I would, just for the sake of time, just because we do have a, a few more people that would like to speak tonight. Is it okay? Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so one thing that we found, um, this is in multiple places in the world, there have been tests, uh, there, there's been research that's been published out of uh, Mexico, the USA, China, and India uh, that link climate change that link an increase in global temperatures to the rates of suicide around the world. Um, so according to Nature Climate Change, um, this is a, a peer-reviewed journal, uh, their publication in August of 2018, they said suicide rates rose 0.7% in the USA and 2.1% in Mexico um, per one degree Celsius increase in monthly average temperatures. So. Um, even though when we talk about climate, we're talking about you know, this 10 year or 20 year or 30 year average of weather and uh, temperature and rainfall in a particular location. Um, what we're talking about here is actually monthly averages. And we found that a correlation between temperature and suicide rates. And in each one of these countries, in each one of these locations, it's actually for, for pretty different reasons. So um, Nature Climate Change estimated that this is somewhere between 9 and 40,000 additional suicides that could be accounted to climate change across the United States and Mexico by the year 2050. Now, in India, and this is according to the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, they said that climate change is linked to 60,000 suicides in India in the last three decades. Now, um, these suicides are primarily because um, it, they're primarily from farmers um, who've noticed that their crops have not been yielding nearly as much. They've been put through so much more strain in the last few decades. So um, they end up killing themselves from this strain. Of course, it's extremely difficult to um, be certain about what causes a person to uh, die of suicide, um, but Mm, this is according to these to these to these journal articles. Um, also, um, from the National Institutes of Health, they said the impact of ambient. This is um, related to Zhuangzhou, China. The impact of ambient air pollution on suicide mortality. A case crossover study in Zhuangzhou, China. They said a significant increase in suicide risks 
were associated with interquartile range increases in the concentration of air pollutants. So as there were more pollutants in the air, we saw that there was an increase in the number of suicides in this area. Um, in addition to the plethora of effects of climate change, this is just one more. Um, does anybody, would anybody like to add anything to this before we move on? Uh, yeah, right, yeah, I agree. Yeah, actually, actually, yeah, can I, can I just toss this back to you, please? So you talked about India, and, and this, that number is very, very small. The actual numbers are much higher. I would suggest if, if people are you know, willing to read, they, they read a book called Everybody Loves Good. It's a great book on agricultural economics. But what most of the farmers suicide commit suicide because they don't have money to pay back debts. Debts of like $1,000, $2,000, that's it. But they have no way out. That's when they commit suicide. So it's, it's, it is, you know, a, a, that is part. Like I said, if you don't change the economics of it, you're not going to fight climate change in any way whatsoever. Everybody loves a good drought. A good drought. <coughs> drought. Drought. Yeah, I think drought. Not drought. Sorry. Uh, drought, uh, it's by a guy called Sainath. P. Sainath. He's a very, very famous journalist. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's another book, Monoculture of the Mind by Vandana Shiva. Read that too. Mono, uh, Monoculture of the Mind. Oh, fuck my pronunciation. Um, I'd also add to the health problems, uh, increasing infectious disease between water refugees and uh, the changing interface between humans and the environment. Uh, it's predicted in the next 100 years the biggest population boom is going to come out of sub-Saharan Africa. That's also where the most mammalian diversity is. So we're predicting a lot of diseases uh, are going to jump from animals to humans and that's, you've got pandemic threats. So that's another health factor. Right, exactly, yeah. And in those same places... Um, so what, what we're looking at now uh, is a demonstration in Delhi um, against the suicides um, of farmers. So uh, the demonstrator said that these are the bones of the farmers who committed suicide. Um, putting these on, uh, putting these demonstrations on, uh, hopefully for some kind of governmental change. Okay, uh, I believe the last one that we'll get to then um, is climate refugees. Probably a lot of us have, have heard of this already. We're already seeing this in the world. Um, so it's projected that by 2030, there could, be as, there could be more than 100 million additional people that are pushed into poverty. Um, by 2050, and th this is according to the World Bank, by 2050, more than 140 million people could be forced to move out of their homes. And then by the year 2100, this comes from a researcher at Cornell University, by 2100, more than 2 billion people, that's one-fifth of the predicted population world at the time, could become climate change refugees. Um, this is from a lot of different sources. So source number one, as the sea levels rise, there are more island nations that, um, where their, their nation just sinks. Number one, or the sea level rises. Number one. Number two, um, in these places with famine, uh, with drought and with famine, they can't eat or the price of food becomes so uh, unattainable that they have to leave their home country. Okay. Um, I, I really do want to hear from you. I think just for the sake of time, I... Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like it, actually. I think you're, you're great to talk to, man. Yeah, please, please, please. Well, one climate change fact is that it is only because people are poor that we are in this state. If, you, if, if more, less people were poor, we'd be much worse off. So poverty is helping us fight climate change. And that's, that's like a fact. I mean, it's, it's, again, counterintuitive. But that's what is happening. It's the richer countries that are contributing more to climate change, right? And it's the poorer countries that are doing less, basically, because they're poor. The minute they become rich, they're fucked. Yeah. 
evolved to a certain extent, uh, whereby you could actually, you know, design and create a more ecological form of, um, you know, industry or industrial revolution or post in post industry as well. Mm. I mean, like you could actually like tweak it as, as like like an app. Oh, so like like an app, <laughs> you could tweak like the um, the mode of industry, like an app. You know, if you s if the richer countries are more advanced and civilized and such, then then they could obviously design technologies like building techniques to create a more um, environmentally friendly um, society. Yeah. yeah, China's doing it. China's the perfect example at the moment. Really, we're well not the perfect example because they actually are like quite lax on um, human rights. But with regards <laughs> to but like, <laughs> but, like <laughs> but at the same time, what country isn't as well? So. Oh no. Okay. Okay. Um so, um many of the most terrifying articles on the next 20 and 30 years and even 15 years uh of the planet, um they eventually get to this point of political instability. So because of the rising sea levels and the flooding and the drought and the famine, there causes this climate migration. And because of this climate, because of these climate um, refugees, um, there are going to be less places, not because of these climate refugees. Let me rephrase. So, because of all of these changes, there are going to be less resources. And we're going to be having people fighting over these resources. We're going to have climate refugees. And if we've seen anything in, say, the last four years of international politics, we know that the world isn't currently set up to handle a lot of refugees. And when there are a lot of refugees, um, there are big problems. Well, as the number of refugees increases because of the rising sea levels, the flooding, the drought, and the famine, there's going to be intense political instability, and the fear is that eventually this will lead to war. So, um, if you read a lot of articles uh, about the future of climate change, it can be really really scary, um, talking about World War III and how, unlike, well, and, and, uh, about now we have the potential to just completely obliterate everything, right? This could be the biggest problem that we ever face in the whole world. <sighs> Leading us into our next small group discussion, guys. All right, so the question, <laughs> if Earth were visited by aliens, what would they think of the human species? <laughs> so uh, we'll take about, uh, say, 10, 15 minutes for this one. Then we'll come on back. Uh, we're going to hear from Justin. We'll hear from Govinda. Hopefully James came here. We're going to hear from Mai Chung. Um, and then we're going to call it a night. So thank you very much, guys. Thanks for sticking around. Grab a drink. Grab some food. And uh, we'll come back in about five, fif 10, 15 minutes. All right. Thanks, guys.